Welcome everybody to the webinar series. My name is Brooke Edmonds. I'm with Oregon State University Extension and I organized this webinar series for our master gardeners for continuing education, but it's also open to the public. And I think today's uh, topic is maybe near and unfortunately near and dear to some of our hearts. Uh, we're gonna be talking about rats and dealing with non-native rodents in the garden. Um, so I'm really happy to introduce Dana Sanchez. She is a member of the of Oregon State University and the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. And we always call on her when we have our critter questions in the garden. Um, she's done deer for us and digging rodents for us. And so we're really pleased to have Dana here today to talk about um, dealing with rodents in the garden. So give us just a moment. I'm going to stop my share and let Dana pull up her presentation and then she can take it away from there. All right. We're good to go. I think you're good. Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Well, thank you, Brooke. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to be talking with you. I'm not sure I can say it's a pleasure to talk about rats, but it's a reality that we, uh, many of us are managing. So I want to also remind everybody who's uh, hearing my voice that we have this great tool uh, offered by Oregon State University for any question across a whole range of our extension knowledge called the Ask an Expert system. You see in the bottom of my screen there um, the link directly to there. What's great about Ask an Expert is that you can upload your question as well as pictures, which I can say as the wildlife biologist, pictures uh, are very helpful in my work when I'm working with folks um, over that tool. So please be aware of that. Um, and I wanted to start with some thoughts about rats uh, that aren't immediately about the conflicts because we are all here probably talk, to talk about conflicts with rats. There are quite a few species of ratus uh, around the world. Um, some fun facts about some of those is that rats in fact laugh. Uh, they're quite intelligent. Uh, they have this thing called source memory separate from location memory. So they have excellent location memory, which if any of you have had spilled bird seeds, such as I have, turn into a rat magnet, you know they've got excellent location memory. But they also have this amazing semi-superpower of source memory. So they remember what they ate. So if something, we'll talk about this more of when we get to eradication issues, if something makes them sick, they remember and then they avoid it. Uh, rats are very social. Many of them are great swimmers. I read that one species in particular can tread water for three days. That's amazing. Some rats have learned how to fish and are large enough to subdue a fish. They use those nearly hairless tails as part of their body cooling system. Uh, they are rodents, gnawing rodents, so their front teeth, their incisors never stop growing. They've got ever-growing teeth so that they have the, that vital tool uh, well into their older age. They are actually worshipped in more than one culture around the world. Uh, they are extremely, especially uh, Norvegicus or the Norway rat has been domesticated and is an extremely important part of our medical research for human health. And then the flip side of that is that the CDC lets us know that rats and mice as a group can carry or spread directly diseases and or parasites that can lead to disease of 35 different types. So those are some facts to get us started. But then I want to go ahead and, and get into why we're here today. Now, if you've come to any of my other talks about wildlife human conflicts, this slide will look very familiar. It's the same one I use. 
what's interesting about rats is that they manage to tick every one of these boxes, whereas most species tick one or two. So when rats get into our structures or even our RVs or our vehicles, or they eat and damage things that we don't want them to outdoors, they can uh, cause structural damage and loss to infrastructure at the personal as well as the uh, agriculture and, and industrial scale. And as I mentioned in that last point on the last slide, they can pose some physical risk to humans. Um, and I'm going to see if this works. Let's see. I won't show you too much of it, hopefully. Oh, we're not seeing that video. Oh, you're not. Okay. No, it must be on a different screen. Um, well, you'll have to. And, um, let me see if I can get to stop now. Okay. Well, I, I have given you the address. So there is a video I'd hope to share that uh, it was just showing. I'm, I'm actually not positive where the video was shot. There's some controversy about it, but it, what it shows is dozens of rats escaping an industrial kitchen up a standpipe into the roof, uh, and they just keep coming. And, and the fact that they are scaling a relatively smooth-sided pipe is also pretty impressive. So where do the conflicts happen? Um, well, to really think about that, we have to also adopt the rodent lens, if you will, of what are they doing there and what are they seeking? And that makes me go into wildlife scientists, kind of geek speak. We need to talk about the habitat concept from the animal's point of view. So habitat is a combination of factors, both living and non-living, that are necessary to allow members of a particular species, so in this case probably black and brown rats, to occupy a location to be able to survive there and ultimately to be able to reproduce. And when we talk about habitat quality, it is really speaking to the abundance of quality accessibility of those resources and remembering that safety, uh, i.e. low risk of being eaten by something else or killed by something else, so predation risk, is part of the equation of habitat quality for most species of animals, including the rats we're talking about. So how did this all get started? Um, why do humans, if we look in art and history, we see lots of events and representations of rats. It seems like they've been with us forever. And that is because they probably have been. So I'm giving you at the bottom of the slide a citation for a very extensive genetic um, study of the geographic origins of what we call commensalism uh, in rats specifically, a relationship between two species, the rat and our own, in which one greatly benefits the rats and the other receives little to no cost. So the other species that's providing all the resources doesn't blink out and go extinct. Um, what these authors found is that there was a big split genetically from the first rat that we we recognize as ratus that's the genus a million years ago and then there was another big splitting or speciation 500,000 years ago and along all the branches as uh, rats moved into different parts of the globe they uh, developed uh, they speciated, they turned into specific uh, species, and that the relationship as they encountered humans, early humans and modern humans, they developed commensalism. So commensalism, that dependence or, or that uh, profiting from humans by rats has developed in many places many times. Um, and that just tells us ecologically that they are really good at tracking us. They love how we disturb 
natural uh, landscapes and vegetation, and we produce all kinds of yummy garbage uh, that they can eat. So um, this rat, by the way, uh, I've got quite a few uh, black and white recent photos from my own yard. This rat is visiting a place in which I had not been fully capturing the spilled bird seed. Uh, from my seed feeder. The wheel there is a wheelbarrow that I put under the seed feeder until I could come up with another solution to catch that outfall because I knew it was uh, turning into a rat magnet. And this, this guy is visiting, um, let's see, it says 1220 in the morning, <laughs> um, three days after I had stopped the downflow of food. So this is a great example of this rat has learned about this place, this location that provides food. There's really no new food falling in there, but it's like, hey, why not go by there? I've gotten fed there before. Um, okay, so this I know is challenging. So the books all say it's really easy to tell between the little black rat up on the top and the larger Norway rat. But when they're running past you at Mach 2, it's really hard to do any species diagnosis, even for me. So, uh, but what we can take away from this is that we've got some general body form differences. I'm going to talk more in detail about each of these species. So the little roof rat or black rat, that was the one on top here, longer tail, little bit uh, skinnier snout, uh, originally probably from India. This is the species that that genetics paper uh, goes back and says is kind of the parent rat species from which others developed. We see these black ship rats everywhere now, pretty much except Antarctica. Um, they tend to be more concentrated in coastal and waterway areas. Ironically, despite being associated with riparian coastal and waterway port areas, they don't swim a lot. And interestingly, they're not known for inhabiting sewers in great numbers but they are great climbers. They're very acrobatic. They often nest up high, especially where we also have Norway rats because the heavier, more aggressive Norway rats outcompete them and pretty much the only safe places are above where the Norways are nesting. Um, let's see here, what else should I say? Notice on the right side of the slide, I say their range or the area that they use in a given day is about 120 square yards. I should have put a little star by that. I'm going to talk in more detail about space use uh, and spatial ecology. I'm going to uh, take the, the easy way out and say, it depends. Okay, there are a lot of factors influencing how rats move across our landscapes. Uh, they do uh, work together to defend a group territory, and um, I had not known this before. They're one of the species that can let the end of their tail drop off. So if you grab them by the end of their tail and you end up with a tail, uh, that is one of their adaptations to escape predation. All right, the larger Norway rat, or Norvegicus, is native, uh, originally it was in ecosystems that had forests and lots of brushy areas in Northern China. Um, we, they are thought to have arrived here in what we call the United States about two centuries later than the little ship rats. They're a much larger animal in general. Certainly though, if you had a juvenile, you know, one of the teenagers, it may be about the same size as a black rat till it gets to uh, feed up and get bigger. They too are very social. The females actually do like uh, nursery care for each other's young. They are well known for building complex burrows and tunnels. And one animal's range, again, star by this, could be up to half an acre. 
they likely in really nice climates such as Western Oregon, it's not uh, out of bounds to say that they could probably breed year round. Uh, they're thought to produce about seven litters a year. Uh, you see they've got a fairly short pregnancy and they have what's called a postpartum estrus. So as soon as the female gives birth to the last pup in a litter, she enters estrus and can be bred again. Um, so you can see where in a really good year of high, high food availability, she could probably exceed uh, the, the minimum number of uh, pups produced in a year. Now remember that many of those rat pups are not going to survive to reproductive age. Uh, that's a strategy that prey species use to make up for high predation as they produce a lot of, of offspring. So getting into managing the conflicts, again, if you've seen my other talks, this is a slide that's modified from that. And uh, with many species, I can really point to one or two of these as the go-to thing that we need to do. Uh, with rats, I'm going to really talk about the one at the very bottom, but to fully manage within our homes, yards, and gardens, we're going to need a full press and use all of these tools and techniques. So the first thing we can do is to be mindful of just how omnivorous or eat everything or anything rats are. That's one of the ways they've been so successful in spreading uh, across the globe and following humans. So there are lots of places on our human landscapes that we don't even think of as rat food that we may be producing attractive rat food. So little things that we've forgotten about, that spilled bird seed, uh, the, the discarded lumber and you know stick piles that we keep meaning to take care of. Um, it's not that they're going to eat the lumber or maybe the trash, it's that other animals are going to be drawn to it. And those can be food for rats, as well as the growth of fungi and other plants and seeds, things like that. Um, accidentally leaving out pet leftovers or small livestock food, things like that. And then in the garden area, we really, uh, we are deliberately creating very rich environments that produce food for us. But there's always going to be some fruit that doesn't quite shape up or it got pierced by a bird and we're not going to pick that one or it falls off or even some of our landscaping plants have droops and fruits and seeds that every year fall to the ground and we kind of, it's like, oh, I'll manage that mess later. But if the food landscape is getting a little short in other ways, that food may become a really good resource for rats. Absolutely, when we're talking about rats, trying to keep them out is going to be part of the equation. I want to highlight the danger of this one image. I need to search for a better image of this fence that's playing multiple roles. Um, it's keeping things from jumping in or out of a place. And then it's got what we call a metal apron that goes below the ground and out towards whatever we're trying to keep out. Do not bury chicken wire. It won't last very long and rats go through it like butter. So um, the go-to tool against rat incursion, whether we're talking about our home, uh, or our fence or our chicken coop is going to be what's called hardware cloth. It's a, a larger gauge um, or a thicker gauge and it's welded wire. Uh, I would strongly recommend half inch apertures on that to keep rats out. 
I have been hearing about both rats and things like gophers and moles literally popping up into people's raised beds. And the way to fence out one angle on those is to underlay them with that hardware cloth. Um, thinking about how we're talking about these rats earlier and how big they can get, but also remember that one of the things rats can do so well besides climbing and sniffing things out, is they can squeeze themselves down to very, very small sizes. As long as their head can get through a hole, uh, they can get in. So if we open up um, one of our crawl space vents to get a cable through or something like that, we need to go back and reinforce that barrier with something that is not chewable. So remember I mentioned those ever-growing front gnawing teeth. We don't want to try to keep them out with anything that they can chew. So um, sometimes the, this little metal unclimbable skirt around a tree, sometimes what we're going to learn is that an overhanging tree is the elevator for the rats getting into something else that we're trying to exclude them from. This is also a tactic we use like with tree squirrels, for example, as well. Okay, so let me talk you through this slide and why I've got it in here. If you'll remember on the tactic slide, the bottom bullet was reduce carrying capacity through our management. So on this slide, uh, on the left-hand side, it says the animal population size supported. And going across, you will see two dotted red lines. Those are estimates of carrying capacity. Carrying capacity essentially is talking about how many individuals can be fed given the food resources in an area. And what we want is for that carrying capacity to be really low because ideally we would like the number of rats to be zero. But well, I can unfortunately almost guarantee that we'll never get rats to zero. Um, but we can lower the number of rats that we are supporting on our properties and in our cities. Uh, these yellow lines that are kind of wavy going around the carrying capacity uh, lines are the number of rats, essentially. And the reason they're wavy is, uh, to put in science geek speak, is populations tend to oscillate about K. And all that means is that populations of animals are tightly, tightly uh, regulated by how much food there is. At times, the population will grow to the point that there is not quite enough food for all the individuals, and population will start to fall as survival rates go down and as reproduction gets pushed down by the fact that not everyone's getting enough to eat. And then you're quite a little bit below carrying capacity and the population rebounds. So that's where you get those oscillations. What we can do, and what I hope I can convince you that we need to try to do, is that yes, what we typically do is we try to take this number of rats and get it to this lower dotted line by trapping, potentially using uh, toxic baits. So we're going to remove animals from the population. But if we have not done the management to lower the carrying capacity of that patch of habitat, they're just going to pop right back up. So that's the point of this slide. And the tricky part is, as I continue through this presentation, is that we likely need to go talk to our human neighbors and coordinate the strategy because the rats can certainly move beyond one yard worth or one property's worth of food. They're very mobile. Which brings me to the spatial ecology. There's this great paper, I've given the uh, citation here. Uh, they reviewed 
quite a few, a couple hundred papers uh, in the science literature about the movements of rats. And I have here, why do we care? Well, as I just alluded in the last slide, how rats are getting fed and supporting high rates of survival and reproduction has huge uh, connections to what space are they able to use and what are they willing to use. Remember that they are a prey animal. Uh, they are non-native and invasive here, so they do not have native predators. But in their home regions, they are definitely prey animals that, that sit at the base of the food pyramid, essentially. And so their ecology is all ready to maximize opportunities to boost their survival and their reproduction. They're acting as a prey species, even though we don't have very many predators to take them here. And so if you're always in a landscape of fear, that really influences how you move through the landscape and the choices you make. And um, so the home range level uh, is really how much space an animal or a group of animal uses on a daily basis within, say, one season to get what they need to survive and reproduce. Um, the determinants that these authors, uh, the, the key uh, determinants that they discovered through their literature review was that the habitat quality, again, how many resources, what quality, um, really determined how much space an animal you had to use. So if you know that there are things out there trying to kill you, and you've got lots of good resources that you can reach without traveling very much because travel is risky, then you'll use a relatively compressed area. What rats do is they respond to that. So they use small core areas connected by narrow pathways. And if you've watched rats moving around, you'll see that they have some favorite pathways that are often very protected. They also have to avoid uh, the social fencing uh, issue is that if you've got more dominant rats that are likely to attack you, you have to kind of make sure your pathway avoids getting beat up. Um, and that males and females tend to uh, look out. They also have the uh, dominance issues that they need to pay attention to and it influences how they use space. So interestingly, uh, where people have calculated a home range size for Norway rats, their core areas are really only 11%, so very small concentrated areas of use. It's larger for black rats. And then here's the kicker, but, so this is where I'm going to say it depends. Longer movements are definitely being observed when especially Norway rats have access to sewers and other utility corridors to move through. So um, fidelity is a measure of how consistently do they come back to the same places. That's been observed in Norway rats specifically that is very strong. So Getting back to my bird feeder here on the left during the day, the goldfinches are having a little barbecue party out there. And here, you know, now weeks later, uh, that site is just to the right of where the shot was aimed. The rat is still coming back just in case because it's gotten fed there before. So more about rats about town, as they say. Um, Dispersal from the natal site. So when young animals uh, reach um, usually sexual maturity or basically they've gotten all the support from mom that they're going to support, they undergo a process called dispersal. Some species um, disperse relatively short distances and these authors classified uh, the two rats we're concentrating on in that category. 
And what that means is genetically, uh, you've got really high genetic relationships within about a third of a mile. So if you were able to take little cheek swabs of all the rats within a, an area, what you're going to find, because mostly males do the longer dispersal to avoid inbreeding, is that you've got families and subfamilies of closely related females all close together. So they don't just pick up and go overland long distance the way some species do. But, here's another but, there was one documented dispersal by a male Norway that went more than seven miles. And I have a little question in here. You know, one of the things about rats that they have demonstrated all too well is that they accept help from human transportation, ships, trains, planes, uh, autos, trucks, you name it, they, they have ridden around on those. So we have to wonder, given roads and trails, whether that rat that was documented to move seven miles from where it was born had a little help. But I will also tell you that it is not outside the bounds of imagination for an animal to just do that on its own. So animals are often capable of much longer movements than we imagine possible. Um, when are animals moving around? Well, typically they tend to be what we call nocturnal and crepuscular. So they move around when it's relatively early, early dawn, overnight, and as it's just becoming evening and starting to get dark. This is an adaptation to try to minimize their exposure to predation risk. As I've mentioned a couple times, they really stick to familiar pathways, especially near edges and cover. So uh, the walls of buildings, the edges of a hedge, uh, things like that, that will allow them to both conceal themselves and potentially escape. Interestingly, human disturbance, uh, both of what we would think of as the natural environment, as well as in the highly urban environment, can actually increase exploration by neighboring populations of rats. So in some cities, urban planners and engineers are now aware of needing to go in and eradicate the rats from a building that's about to be demolished and redeveloped that site, for example, because they know that even when they do that, there is going to be a huge influx from neighboring rats. And if you added that to what survived the implosion, that neighborhood would just be overrun. When we do, quote, eradication, when we, we've done our trapping, our poisoning, uh, we think we've trapped down every animal. What's been shown with experimental data is that reintegration or migration into that cleared area takes only four weeks total and you'll have the same, if not higher, population of animals. And then finally, uh, barriers. Roads can sometimes act as barriers. So that conclusion comes from people who have mapped where rats go using little radio collars or GPS or all kinds of other ways to follow rats, is what they noticed is that home ranges tend not to span over a road, but separate core areas can for the same animal or the same colony, which tells us that they likely have a route around, over, or through that road. So they can use sewers, trees. You see the photo here is a shrub in my backyard. I suspected. I know that the, the daytime tree squirrels are using this um, 
this particular shrub as one of their ways from yard to yard. So there's a fence behind the shrub. They come down out of neighboring trees, go across the fence, they jump into the shrub and come into my yard. And um, I suspected that the rats were likewise using that pathway. So I tested my hypothesis by setting up a camera trap and in the very first night, yep, there they are. Um, so rats definitely use the infrastructure, the human built infrastructure, as well as natural features like this to get around barriers like my fence. Okay, and even if you bury that fence line below ground so they can't underdig it, remember that they can find a way in. We have to think about these routes they're using to access uh, places we're trying to protect. My big conclusion from reviewing these folks' review of the literature about the spatial ecology of these animals is that as managers, we really need to work together. Individual homeowners uh, on a block, uh, I know that rats, one of the things they benefit with humans is we don't really like to talk about rats. We have created some shameful feelings about them or we want to avoid talking about them. And that's to the rat's advantage because to effectively manage them, it's really going to be beneficial to we humans to talk about rats and how can we reduce the resources available to them and that's going to include our city and county governments building owners things like that um getting back to some of the other tactics i mentioned lowering habitat quality um, will also include modifying not just the amount of food that those rats can access, but making them feel less safe. Because remember, that is one of the things that influences how they choose where to go. Um, if we can manipulate the habitat to raise the da danger of detection, I mentioned cover and structures of edges that they like to travel along because it gives them a sense of safety. Well, most of us don't have a weasel like this one in the, the uh, photo, and most of us can't just order, you know, rent a heron to come and scare them. But if we can create a landscape picture that looks like, ooh, if I travel through here, a predator could see me, that will help make our area a little less alluring to them. Um, I mentioned that few, if uh, any, scent products have really uh, proven effective against any species such as rats, but rats in particular, uh, people are doing experiments, for example, with cat urine, dog urine, uh, various other predators' urines, and it may, uh, the results of those studies is that it may push the rats to just use a different off-ramp, for example, but they still get to the goal. So it's interesting um, that they see that as a physical barrier, like a road. It's like, okay, well, we'll go around a different way. So I also acknowledge one of the really vexing things about rats is they're, they can be really hard to kill. They're easy to kill, but they're hard to kill. If you're able to get one into a snap trap, then it's pretty easy to kill them. The trick is that they have this fabulous fear of new things. So when they see that new trap or the bait box that this animal in the bottom slide is sitting on top of, they are like, oh, it's something else to climb on. Oh, nope, it didn't hurt me, but I'm not going in there. Nope, not doing it. Uh, I mentioned before that they have this thing that I almost think is a superpower of source memory. It is absolutely remarkable that if a food item that they ate within the last 24 to 48 hours makes them feel ill, they will, quote, learn to avoid that. And that makes uh, bait resistance very much a problem with many rodents, but especially rats. Um, they're also fast, agile, as I mentioned with the cat urine, they, they manage to 
uh, modify their activity paths and timing to stay away from scary predators like us and our dogs, for example. But snap traps are probably one of the best tools that we can use as homeowners uh, to battle some of these population numbers. We need to do something. So how to be most effective while you're doing that. First, choose traps that are sized for rats, okay? I know that sounds obvious, but these are animals that are much larger than mice. You need a strong, uh, really snappy trap to humanely and kill uh, and thoroughly immediately kill a rat. Wear gloves when you're moving these and setting them. Uh, one, because as we're all much aware right now, cleanliness and uh, health are closely linked. So we don't want to be uh, contacting traps that animals have been potentially defecating and urinating on, things like that. But from the rat's perspective, they know that we are mega predators. They know to associate our scent with heightened fear. They're already neophobic and able to avoid traps quite often. So make sure you minimize how much of your scent you put on this tool. Teach the rats that the traps are no big deal. So you are going to set those traps the first time and give them a food reward for crossing it, but don't set the trigger. That will help hopefully habituate them and lower their neophobia so that they will willingly cross that trigger pan uh, in the future once you do set it. Put the trigger 90 degrees uh, in, into the pathway, so not blocking the pathway once you've discovered some of those likely uh, runways. I have quite successfully, and I know others have successfully trapped rats at times with absolutely no bait. Those animals are undoubtedly, when I look at them, juveniles that kind of haven't learned the way of the world yet. They saw something in their travel path, they kept going, and they didn't get the memo about avoid strange new things. Uh, but in general, it's helpful to offer bait. So smelly cheese is, uh, the smelly varieties of cheese are known to help uh, attract the black rats and peanut butter is kind of the universal offering for trapping everything from bears to rats essentially. Uh, use lots of traps. But the big point at the very bottom is very, very important. You have to place these traps very carefully because the trap doesn't know what's triggering it. So we don't want to be injuring, torturing, or killing non-target victims such as our native birds. And finally, I forgot to mention this, there are electronic traps for rats uh, in interior spaces that they're battery operated. I have not gotten any personal experience with these tools yet, but they apparently quickly electrocute the animals. Um, the makers claim that they're very effective. Uh, then finally, toxicants or poisons as tools. Remember in that graph where I showed number of animals and one of our practices, the habitat quality, it's really important to acknowledge that sometimes we uh, do choose to use toxicants, but we have to use them carefully, so just like a trap. A poison has no idea what it is inhaling it or ingesting it. When you choose to use these uh, tools, you must read and follow the restrictions on the label. The label is the law. So even if you buy this at your home and garden store, you are still now engaging in using a product that must by law be used exactly as the label directs. Okay, uh, I know I'm running short on time. One thing that I frequently hear 
is that cats can go on rat patrol. Well, people have actually studied the effects of cats that are running loose. They are driving multiple of our species worldwide, including the United States, to extinction. This is just a fact. Birds, mammals, and reptile species are being severely impacted by cats. Again, I love my cat, but they are a non-native species here. So our native wildlife have not had the ecological time to develop a predator prey detection or knowledge to avoid being killed by them. So there is good data that uh, cats are killing at least 1.3 to 4 billion, that's billion with a B, birds every year. So what, when we're talking about rat management, we would have to say, well, does that long range, very long range cost really uh, get justified by cat's effectiveness against managing uh, non-native rodents. And the, the data says no. Uh, so these people actually tracked and filmed cats and rats in an urbanized setting, the movements, the effectiveness, how many times the cats actually attempted to prey on the rats and they only in the whole, they had over 300 cat rat close interactions. Three rats got hunted and uh, two got killed. <laughs> so uh, they are, cats are smart too. They prefer smaller, more defenseless prey because rats don't give up easily. Uh, at the bottom, there's some great links. Uh, if you have a cat that you want to be able to have enjoyment of outdoor spaces and stimuli, catios are all the rage. They're great and they protect the cats as well as the native wildlife. Um, I'm going to skip that. So I wanted to also make you aware, you've probably read this recently in the news, that some heritage work for terriers, which were bred to work with humans in rodent management, the terrier packs or the terrier man are back into the future. Uh, the advantages of allowing an domesticated animals bred for this work to do this work is that you eliminate the need for toxic baiting. If you do strategic trapping, and allow the dogs to tell you which areas are currently active, your trapping effectiveness goes up. There are active packs working here in Oregon. Um, they're getting a lot of media play in New York City. Um, uh, the, many of our vineyards are using them, etc. So these are some local working terriers and their handlers. Um, there doesn't seem to be on their, their final shot there on the left that many rats, but that's because that's the second or th at least third time they've been there. And that small pack of uh, terriers has reduced the population enough that they have impacted the ability of the population to produce more rats. Uh, so they're actually having a significant impact for that agricultural producer. I want you to be aware of when rats are concerned, they kind of span that wildlife conflict versus pest management uh, boundary. It's like they are animals, but they're not native wildlife. Who manages them? Um, it comes down to there are many of our wildlife control operators who also do rats. Their main management is for native wildlife species, but some do go into managing rats. And then, as you're probably well aware, they're also private pest control companies. So uh, with any contractor, whether it's a plumber, an electrician, or a pest management, make sure you ask for a free estimate of, and scale of work and that the people are going to be uh, safe working on your property. Um, 
and, and that you're going to know exactly what you're being charged for. So this is not uh, immediately in, in the scope of what I wanted to talk about today, but I thought I would put this slide here in case it's of interest. Hopefully we can make my slides available to you just to let you know that, um, that people are often concerned rodents, hantavirus, we hear that a lot. Um, Roof uh, rats or black rats and our Norway rats have a lot of negative uh, impacts and interactions with us, but fortunately, hantavirus is not one of those. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop talking and hand this back over to Brooke. Thank you so much, Dana. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were talking well, before. Some nightmares, maybe, or dreams, something. I think I want to get one of those uh, cameras and see what, what's going on in my yard. <laughs> I know, I know. It's a, a new hobby for me, too. I, I've only used them to gather scientific data, but it's like, oh, this is actually COVID kind of entertaining. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have a bunch of questions and okay. folks, if we're not able to answer your questions in the next eight minutes, we'll be getting back to you. We'll also send out an email with some of the links and um, presentations and things we'll get out to you. So a couple of questions about um, not getting the, the non-target issue. So yeah. Sandy wants to know, how do you set a rat trap so the birds don't get in it? Mm -hmm. Lynn had a similar question. How best can you avoid you know, accidental trapping. Those, great. Thank you for, for opening up discussion on that. It can be really heartbreaking. I have done it, I think most of us have, because where rats roam, especially if they're coming into bird seed or a garden area, can also be places that our native birds are hopping around, especially some of the sparrows and even the large sparrows like towhees uh, and our ground uh, feeding birds like doves. So there can be a risk there. Um, I would say the best thing you can do is just site location. So if you've got a trap that is along an edge, a wall, for example, or the, the side of a raised bed, and then using a box, sometimes putting it in a box where the ends obviously are open, if it's big enough to allow just the treadle to be across the pathway, then the, the rat can still travel over that and tra trigger the trap. But by putting a box around, it's kind of like the bait boxes for the toxic poisons when we have to choose to use those, is make sure that it, the trap is now not accessible to a bird. So a, a towhee, for example, is not going to just land on that thing and think it's something that it can pe peck around and and trap itself. So that's how uh, I would advise doing it. And, and location. So for example, the, the photo that I had where the rat is coming down out of that shrub, uh, the architecture of that shrub, that is an area that if I choose to put a snap trap in there, my first concern is not going to be birds in that case because most of the ground foraging birds are not going to use that spot. But I do want to avoid trapping tree squirrels. So if I were to use it again, I would place it in a way such that that's part of why I'm using the camera traps is like exactly what is their travel path? And then how can I ar armor my trap to only get the rat. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, Carol has a question. So she has a bird feeder and gets um, her bird seed from a store and they also sell an extremely hot sauce that I guess you can make oh. the rat, mm -hmm. I don't know, resistant. Do you have any um, thoughts on, you know, these hot sauces and? I, I don't have any information about those. Um, I, I can say in general, I would be a little skeptical. Um, we often have short-term effects of avoidance. Again, rats have a great neophobia. 
So they've got that to avoid it in the first place. So it may be effective, at least in the short term. And then we also have this process called habituation, where one brave soul is going to help go ahead and have a nibble of it. And they're like, oh, that's kind of bad. But nothing bad happens. Because remember that rats have that amazing source memory. If it doesn't actually hurt them, and if they can, quote, get used to or habituated to the taste, I'm guessing they're going to, over a period of time, just ignore it. That, that would be my concern with that product. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions on composting. So Sherry yeah. and Usha both want to know, is there any advice? We're all gardeners. We love to have mm -hmm. our compost pile, which sounds like a rat buffet, <laughs> like yeah. the Las Vegas of... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for rats. Um, any tips on rat proofing our compost piles? Well, I mean, as gardeners, you know, a hot compost pile, so fast processing is really important. That's, I guess, the very first thing. In some cases, I would say if I had composting on my horizon here, which I probably do, I'm in Corvallis, and I have been managing rats the whole time I've lived here is I would probably contain it. So that would constrain me from having good size compost piles that would allow me to compost my whole yard, for example. But I am fairly certain knowing my site that if I don't keep it in an enclosed tumbler or something like that to do the, the turning, that I'm probably going to even as hot as I can keep it, I may not be able to keep the rats out of it. Um, having, I think that there are a lot of human on human conflicts around compost piles as well as urban chickens and other urban livestock. Um, I think with good management though, and being mindful of how are you conducting those things? How are you conducting your compost? How are you conducting your livestock feeding? That quite often those human-human conflicts need to be like, and here is how I am excluding rats. No, the rats are not eating my chicken food or my compost, and here's how I can show you that. So, so it is a valid concern, but well-managed. Um, some people are, are going to not want to go to an enclosed composter, then you have to think about how will you keep the rats out? Maybe you do the hardware cloth under where your compost pile is going to be so that they can't burrow up into it. Because besides being food in the winter time, that's going to be a nice toasty place to hang out and have kids. And so um, exclude them from that pathway in. And then can you enclose it? with hardware cloth or an electric pen poultry fence or how are you going to keep them out? So don't, don't avoid composting, just be thoughtful about how you do it. I didn't even think about them overwintering essentially in our- Oh yeah, defense. it's a great place to stay and play and have buffet and- Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. um, Brenda has a question that relates to um, how the rats are moving you know, from yard to yard mm -hmm. about um, the trees. So you said that they can travel along fences, but then they can also go from house to house by trees. How far do rats jump? Well, how far should she be pruning back her tree branches to, you know, have them not have access? I don't actually have data on how far they can jump. Um, I would also remind you that they find a lot of different ways in. So I'm thinking more and more about barriers. So one of my colleagues, who's also a wildlifer, uh, regularly watches the rats migrate into his yard or wait for him to go inside in the evening via uh, an overhead power or phone line, something like that. And then they're basically parachuting in. <laughs> um, so even though he has good clearance, um, that hasn't completely cut off the travel. Um, so it may be more a matter of if you have close contact, I would bet that rats can probably jump a couple feet. 
tree squirrels can jump and incredible if you've seen that recent youtube video of the obstacle course with tree squirrels they were jumping 10 feet i don't know that rats are able to go that far but they are very athletic so i would say um i'm going to be looking to prune at least a foot and i'd probably be safer to go two feet but that's not a prescription. Don't go cutting down all of your trees. Think about how else you can maybe run an electric wire along the top of the fence. I'm considering doing that, uh, deploying that kind of tool to keep electricity working outdoors <laughs> is tricky. So I'm also already going to have to do some pruning to make that solution work, so. Great. Thank you for all of this information, folks. We are um, just over our time. There's a bunch of questions. Um, we'll sort through them and see which ones um, Dana might be able to answer offline. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email that has the um, link to the recording and some of the resources and that fun video that uh, we weren't able to see. So we'll get that to you for your afternoon viewing pleasure. And I just wanted to really thank you so much, Dana, for coming to talk to us again. All right. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.